If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Our conversation today at Horse Chats has been brought to you by Equitana, who are now celebrating 20 years of bringing Australian horse lovers everything they love, including equine entertainment, exhibition and competition. So join us on the 15th to the 18th of November in the heart of Melbourne to witness a packed program, including the main event, full flight, dressage freestyle, the all-star, the way of the horse, and the Australian show jumping record attempt, which has been held for almost 39 years, as well as the best equine retail therapy with more shops than Melbourne Central itself. Today's guest is Melanie Quick. Now, Melanie is an equine veterinarian. She's also had a 44-year riding career. She's got a background in jumping, eventing and dressage and trained a first horse to Grand Prix dressage level by the age of 17. She spent 23 years as an equine lameness veterinarian, 25 years shoeing and trimming, 14 years equine spinal manipulative therapist, and I think she's also doing some work with thoroughbred racehorses at the moment as they recover from injuries. How are you today, Melanie? Very well, thank you. Now, just checking, we normally start people off with a favourite quote, and I'm sure you've got one for us today, as well as lots of other information, very valuable information for us, but your favourite quote, what's, um, what's inspired you and influenced you with horses or something that you just like to tell people? Uh, pretty simple, really. I've had it since I was a child. It was the old, good old, if it's first you don't succeed, try, try again. Yep, I think that's a pretty good one, isn't it? Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> it completely applies to horses. Yeah, yeah. Is there any time in particular, I've probably been lots of times, any time in particular that you can look back and go, yep, I really needed to know that then? Well, that's permanently happening. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you just never stop learning. It doesn't matter how many degrees I collect. I always find out I still don't, don't know what I think I know. So <laughs> it's always, you just... That just never stops, sadly. How did you start with horses? You know, think about a really early memory and something that, that may have happened that you can talk about. Since before time, really. Apparently I was riding before I could walk mm-hmm. uh, and I uh, had my first pony at two and I think by about four my parents said, well, if you can't figure out how to do girth up tight, then that's your bad luck, you can land on your head. So... Uh, <laughs> I uh, was just out there always with them, riding, but didn't come in the house, really. Lived outside. The time you didn't do your girth up, what happened then? Well, landed on my head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So it was always going to be a career with horses for you? Oh, uh, I remember in grade one, uh, which in Queensland is pretty young, so I was probably only about four, mm-hmm. people used to say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I used to say I want to go to the Olympics and be a horse vet. Yep. So I never had a question about what I was going to be. Okay. If someone's going to work in the horse industry, what sort of core skills or character traits do you think they need to get started in the horse industry, just to get started? To get started? Mm. Well, you really need patience. Okay. If you're not a patient person, you'll struggle with horses. And you really need a desire in my opinion, and I've only sort of realised this as of age, but you really need the desire for self-improvement. You must be able to do some introspective looking at yourself and and thinking about how you behave and how you react to things. Because if you can't control your reactions and your own behaviour, you'll battle with horses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, if you're open-minded and prepared to look in, then you can see, you know, you can hear people when they suggest you're making a mistake and you can... You can, you know, look at your own body language and, and your style of communication with the animal and, and, and adapt yourself accordingly rather than just being 
uh, reactive against the horse. I yeah. think I think that's what you really need to have success in handling these animals. Okay. And then you working with horses and with horse people, do you think that's the biggest problem that they've got is that they're looking outside for something else to solve the problem? Well, they like to blame the horse a lot, mm-hmm. you know, call it either a crazy horse or a stupid horse or a something or other horse. And in actual fact, horses are very malleable and placid animals that, that don't even appreciate having to go to the violent lengths that they need to go to to deal with us. Yep. So, you know, uh, I think the biggest problem I see in the industry is not so much with the beginners because they are open-minded and they are willing to learn and they are willing to uh, hear criticism. But the, mm-hmm. the biggest problem I see is, is the people who can ride and particularly the higher up you get, the more they think they know, in actual fact, they're really the ones who need to listen and mm-hmm. learn new tricks because there's a lot of old ways in the industry and, and probably I would say in the last decade in particular, things have changed dramatically positively for the horses. You know, People are much more aware of what they're going through and how they're living and and what pain they live in and 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 what trauma they're having in their training. Mm-hmm. And yet our our more successful riders are still stuck in the old fashioned ideas of chuck some kick it harder with the spurs or belt him with the whip or put a better bigger bit on, you know? So and they're the people I have trouble getting through to to the most. So I never my favourite clients are actually beginners or or people who've had twenty years off from riding because they've had kids or, or something and, and they come back in very open and willing to learn because they feel like they don't know anything because they've you know lost touch. They're the good people to deal with. The, the difficult ones are the ones who are more up at the elite levels and then they're, they're, they're not interested. I mean, some of them are not even interested in contemplating saddle fit. Mm, mm, yeah. What about, you know, because you're a vet and a rider, Tell us how your riding's complemented your veterinary practice, but your veterinary knowledge has complemented your riding. Well, the riding certainly in the early years as a young veterinarian gave me an enormous leg up because I I had spent well over 20 years with elite trainers because I was fortunate enough to have Olympic training since I was five years of old of age, and both of those trainers, you know, came a step of step down from Spanish riding school. My first trainer was trained by Franz Moringa. And my second trainer was trained by Podaisky. So th- that was my background, is that I had very high level training, which meant I knew what quality rhythmical movement looked like in the horses. Mm-hmm. So for me to see lameness, it was when I first went into Flemington as a racetrack vet and watched the thoroughbreds trotting around I would stand there and kind of be a little bit shocked at how poorly they moved. And I'd say to my colleagues, who, you know, say we were watching a famous horse trotting up to check it pre-race, I would, I would sort of be a little bit shocked and say to my colleagues, goodness, that's not moving so well. And they'd yeah. be like, oh, what are you talking about? Totally fine. Because their perception of normal was not my perception of normal. My perception of normal was a free-moving, elastic sort of, dressage horse that, that that floated across the ground and, and that's not how a lot of thoroughbreds move. So mm-hmm. from that point of view, it, it, it really gave me an advantage in, in that when trainers were coming to me and saying there's something wrong with this horse, I would say there certainly is, you know, because I can see what you're talking about, whereas others would say, oh, no, that, that looks pretty good because their exposure was a population of horses who were already under a lot of pressure and who were not moving the way they're born to move. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that was the first major advantage there. Yeah, yeah. You've talked about Ruth Emery was trained by Franz Marigo and Warwick Cousins. What about horses, though? Have you got a horse, a standout horse that you'd like to mention that's helped you along with your career? Well, every horse. <laughs> <laughs> the main, I mean, the, the, the main, the little white horse I had when I was young uh, well, I mean, I, I was riding 10 horses a day when I was going through school and in year 12 and, and, and even at university I was riding enormous numbers of horses. But uh, probably the one that sort of, I wouldn't say shattered me, but I was shattered at the time. He, the first one I got to Grand Prix, Belinda's, the white horses that uh, people in Geelong and Victoria probably 
got tortured by me because I used to beat them on a little tiny white Connemara. But um, he he got to Grand Prix dressage and he was my very successful eventing horse. He used, we used to jump jumps that were routinely five foot high and about seven foot wide. So uh, he broke down with ring bone at 17 years of age, which a normal vet would say, oh, well, that's, he did pretty well. However, I no longer believe that. But uh, that him breaking down was quite disheartening because at the time I got uh, a very talented veterinarian, Dr. Alex D. McLean, to look at him because I wanted you know my horses to only have the best. And uh, he said after he x-rayed him, gosh, this horse has got the most horrific ring bone he'd ever seen, and yet he'd been competing at state and national championship event and mm. doing, and of course, training Grand Prix. And he said, I don't even know how this animal was going. And that, at the time, traumatised me and horrified me because I thought, my God, what have I done to this horse? And I also sort of said, well, why is he like that? And he said, oh, well, he's had a heavy competitive career. That's normal. So that was sort of the first horse that put me on this path to trying to figure out why when you get up to those levels, I mean, not only is it devastating to have a Grand Prix horse break down because they are so much fun to ride, mm. and then you've got to go back and ride one that just can only walk from <laughs> Canada. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, but you've just lost 12-plus years of training. Mm. So so that really stuck in my, you know, stuck in my craw, as you would say, but, but probably put me on a veterinary path where I was, determined to find out why why does this why do these diseases happen so he he influenced me there and then the next horse i had which was his replacement was a talented young uh, warm blood that i bred and she went into her first pair of shoes as a four-year-old and she had so much talent i thought this is it this is my olympic dream horse i'd bred her i broke her in you know i had the trainer I had the riding ability, and I thought, wow, I've got the horse, this is it, I'm up, my, my path is ready to go. And she, she had a first pair of shoes go on and went lame five days later, spent the next month, 18 months lame, diagnosis of the disease. Oh, wow. Wow. Shattered, shattered yet again. Mm-hmm. Again, with the questions to the most elite veterinary specialists in this country, why, 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 why does this happen? That they said to me, and again, it was Alison McLean, he said, oh, well, you might have sacked this horse. She'll never have a career. So I said, well, blow that. I, I, don't, I don't listen to no very easily when it comes to, to rescuing my horses. So she, um, my farrier is an engineer, and but my father was, is, a, is an engineer who was our farrier. So he came up and shod her, and, and uh, then I got the local boys to show her because we lived too far apart, and uh, she went crippled lame again so then that's when I had to start shoeing because I couldn't get the work done well enough so that's that's sort of steered me down that path but always in the back of my mind was why 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 is this talented horse gone lame and I mean I did get it we did get it going and she got trained because she was training Grand Prix dressage as well mm-hmm. but she was never as perfect in the front end as I knew she was when she was born and then uh you know, the years went by, I did a few more degrees, got my chiropractic qualifications, and somebody said to me, oh, there's a seminar on feet you can go to, and I said, oh, well, that stuff's all garbage, but I'll come, because that's what I tend to do. If you wave the red rag in front of me, the bull chatters. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go to the seminar just to prove it was what I thought was rubbish, and then found out I was the one who was ignorant. Uh, and that's when I discovered more about feet, and since then, now I know the answer to why horses get ring bone and why horses get navicular disease and why they get laminitis. And I also know how to prevent it and I know how to fix it. So so those two horses in particular profoundly influenced, you know, what con- what seminars and conferences I went to as a veterinarian because I, I've been to every lameness and spinal seminar in the last 20 plus years because I was always chasing the why answer. So you've got everyone on the edge of their seats here because you're talking about preventing, fixing side bone, knee bone, navicular. What tips are you going to give us for that? What can we do to stop that? (laughs) Don't be scared of the barefoot word. Ah, good. Yep. Horses weren't born with steel on their feet, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is 
you know, if you think it doesn't work, it's because you don't have the right technique. And uh, we really, what really needs to happen in this world is we need to stop the uh, the bias against it. And we need to get competition rules changed to allow boots and competition because then you won't have the wastage and loss in the industry because they will at least be living and working in a manner that's much healthier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But but you can't help while while you've got the authorities and and the and the people controlling the situation fearful against it and and refusing saying things like well we'll allow boots in competition and over their dead body and I've had that sort of stuff said to me so we need we need the industry to start pressuring them to say it's not good enough that we have to compromise I mean I have clients who who want to have their horses unshod but they can't because the rules won't permit it. Mm-hmm. Okay, what can we do then as listeners? Is that a matter of, you know, a bit of a groundswell? And, and Well, yes, it's a, gra- a groundswell is required. But, I mean, I think it starts with, um, with, with don't, pick on, don't pick on the people who are trying it. There yeah. are people out there who are trying to have shoeless horses and they get enormous peer group pressure and, and criticism from, from their shod colleagues. So, you know, time to stop picking on them because they're at least having a go. And and also I think perhaps when the farriers and veterinarians are saying, oh, the horse is lame because it needs a shoe on, they need to start gently saying, well, no, actually, apparently there's a, there's, it needs a slightly different technique and then it won't be lame. You know, we, we need to start stopping that knee-jerk reaction and thinking that, oh, just fix it with a shoe. Mm. No, fix it by fixing your technique. Yeah. So just just understand that they function exquisitely without them when you know how. Just thinking about the whole barefoot challenge that you've got, is that your biggest challenge? Mm. Is that the biggest challenge? Do you know with the research, with the work that you're doing, is that the biggest challenge? Oh, that's, that, that's the one that's consumed the last 14 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean the spinal stuff. That that was challenging, but it's not so. Um, people are becoming more and more open to the idea of, of having looking at their horses' bodies and spines and getting them healthier. That certainly has shifted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the foot thing is still look. It's a, it's a lot better than it was ten years ago for sure. But certainly, once you get up into the competitive riders and the elite levels, they're resistant to resistance to it. Is tremendous. I mean, for example, I, I saw a case the other day. The horse has been lame since May. It was meant to be getting sold. It was a show jumper meant to be being sold for a lot of money. It was up in Sydney. It's been brought down to Melbourne so I could have a look at it. Uh, and I had a look at it and certainly, you know, lame in three legs. I said to the owner who's over in Perth, well, look, you're in a hurry to sell this horse. We need to fix it fast. Um, her husband's a farrier, she's a veterinarian. And uh, because of the location issue, that's why they were getting me to look at the horse. And anyway, I pulled the hind shoes off it and the horse stopped walking like a goose that was, you know, a fat bottom goose in the park. That's how yeah, it was yeah. moving. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that, that improved immediately. And then uh, the week later, I pulled the front shoes off it and it went from from three out of five lame at the trot to literally being able to go back into work and ridden if it was wearing boots and pads. Yep. So, and I sort of said to the people, well, look, you know, the horse has got this problem happening in its feet. It's going to take time to grow that out and heal it. However, if you would like to keep him in work with appropriate hoof care and boots and pads, He's perfectly sound and ready to work. And she said, oh, well, but he can't compete in that, which is not quite true because show jumpers certainly can. Oh, no, no, that's no good. He can't compete. And I said, well, you can't ride him at the moment because he's so lame. Yeah. You know, you've got to get your goalposts lined up properly. You need a horse that's sound enough to work first. Worry about your competition a bit later and we can sort that out anyway. Mm. But, but the resistance, because they're up at the elite level, they don't – they have trouble trying new ideas because of what they're used to. Mm-hmm. So that's, yeah. that's the biggest problem, yeah. Yeah. Is, is getting those more elite riders to try something new that they, they you know, feel a little, I guess the pressure to, to succeed makes them get a bit stuck. Okay, okay. 
thinking about the, um, you know, we sort of got a bit a bit sidetracked there, but but horses wise, what do you think so far has been your proudest moment? Oh, I struggled with that question. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had to look it up, look up what the word proud means, Ooh. and uh, still struggling. In fact, have erased it from my memory what the definition of the word proud is. No, I, not nothing proud that I'm proud of yet because I've got this small problem that I always feel like I need to see if it can be done better. Okay. So I'll let you know one day if I can get <laughs> proud of something. If I can get my papers written up on all this hoof work and perhaps get my book written, mm-hmm. if I can achieve that, maybe then I might get proud. But until then, uh, no, I struggle with that one, I'm afraid. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Okay. Now, thoroughbreds, is that much the same problem? Because you've had, you know, you've got, you've spent the last 14 years specifically researching how to improve the resilience and durability of the thoroughbred racehorse. What have you got there for us? What can you say? And and also, too, a lot of people have horses who may not still be racing, but, you know, is this going to be applicable to them? Uh, that's sort of two different fields, that one. The first thing is what I can say that I have learnt in, in the last 14 years playing with these horses. And, I mean, remember that I went into the thoroughbred industry as a sport horse rider. And I only went to the thoroughbred industry because I wanted to learn what they know about keeping performance horses sound. Mm -hmm. That was my motivation there. Uh, And then when I got to the thoroughbred industry, getting a little sidetracked, I apologise, it was actually the thoroughbred industry who taught me how to look for pain better because they don't have training as their skill set. They have treating pain as their skill set. So that actually is what taught me to look for that a lot better. There was one trainer in particular, Peter Morgan, who who used to say, Mal, the horse isn't right, it doesn't want to run. And uh, Or he'd say, Mal, the horse isn't right, he didn't roll over both sides in the sand roll. And initially I thought it was a little bit bonkers, but turns out I was just the ignorant one. And sure enough, there always was something we could find. So I've forgotten the question. Uh, (laughs) um, The thoroughbred... You know, we've learnt enormous things about about them in the last 14 years with this trainer that I've been working with and doing the barefoot research on. But what I can say is they're actually profoundly durable when you take the shoes off. And and, uh, and the things our two horses are having to, to work, I mean, they just don't break down. They just don't get... I haven't inj- had to inject a joint on one of our horses in the last 14 years. And prior to that... I, we were always injecting joints to keep their pain under the thumb. So it's spectacular what's happened for them. But, yeah. again, I've got to get the work written up so people learn about it. Sure. And sure. as far as people um, having an off-the-track racehorse, what I strongly suggest for them is that uh, they need to get them rebroken in because mm-hmm. they're not particularly taught how to steer or stop. Mm-hmm. And they're not expected to. It's quite easy to ride a horse around a, around a track. But most of the trouble people have with, with thoroughbreds off the track is the lack of training in the horse. And, and they assume that because you can get on a walk, trot and canter, that it's got enough training to then go out and be a riding horse or a sport horse. But they really need to have some formal basic education redone. And look, it only take a couple of months. And you'll have a completely different horse. Mm. And then the other thing I also really recommend for people who, who get a horse off the track is get it some rework and, and get its health sorted out because they're working and running under extreme pressure. But it's like having a Ferrari come off the racetrack that actually needed a service and then you try to drive it around wondering why it's not running very well. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Because the car didn't get its final mechanical check before you put it into a different career. So get, get them tuned up and sorted out physically mm-hmm. before you begin. And then half of your emotional battles with them will improve because they had a chance to heal and recover from their previously high-intensity lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, I just want to bring in the the uh, your your other experience of experience. You've got so much experience. I just keep jumping around. But your years as an equine spinal manipulative therapist. What I'm wondering is, is there a correlation between the barefoot and the spine? You know, does that help improve the spine? Is that another area that you're working? Is there any overlap there? Uh, I don't want to push barefoot too much because it puts off people off who have shod horses from coming near me. So I don't, I don't want them to think I'm that biased. <laughs> but uh, uh, sadly, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, horses have a lot of people will be getting chiropractors out for uh, gluteal muscle pain sacroiliac pain, hamstring pain, pain at the base of the neck, and, uh, you know, sort of tricep deltoid muscle pain. All of those painful areas are actually related to foot pain, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, even if you're, if you're not riding on large distances on rough surfaces, a lot of people could help their horses, even if they're still using a regular farrier. Just take the hind shoes off. I mean, there's a lot of horses out there working and competing on surfaces that don't require all four feet at a minimum to be shot. So you can make a massive difference to their lives and to their health and to their performance if you recognise that you may not need to have your hind shoes on. That would that would help enormously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thinking about when you first started as a vet and then moving on to different areas, if you were going to say something to yourself when you first graduated as a vet, what would you tell yourself? Think of advice, thinking of advice that you would give to newly graduated vets. Oh, that's a tricky one. To a newly graduated vet, um, probably the most useful thing. It's tricky because there's a big difference between what I know as a vet and what they're trained now because I've spent years privately researching and a lot of the work I've done is not not published stuff so the vets are, can only be taught what's officially published and, and sort of known but research tends to be 20 to 50 years ahead of institutions so probably what I would say is that is, is a young vet would need to be aware that even though they've probably come out of one of the best vet schools in the world because Australian veterinarians are actually very, very good. Um, just being in an institution doesn't mean it's not valid. That's what I would say. Mm-hmm. It's that everyone needs to keep their own mind. And, and yes, there's a huge push towards evidence-based medicine because of the harm that untrained people can cause to animals. Uh, however, so you need to listen with an open-minded, healthy scepticism. That's probably what I would say. <laughs> okay. If All that right. makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, thinking about our listeners aren't newly graduated vets. They're, they're horse people from quite a few different areas. But have you got a book that you'd like to recommend then? That's something that's going to complement um, everything else that you've you've talked about today? Well, anything written by, by Pajarski. Yep. And probably the simplest one which can profoundly change your life is John Chatterton's 10 Steps. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very easy little book to read, plenty of pictures in it. But uh, he talks about basic handling training for the horse, which correlates exquisitely over into, into a sport horse career. And, in fact, a lot of his work is not done by horse breakers. And is the reason, the fact that it's missing is why you have horses that don't bend and soften and relax into work and or who rush off or don't stop or don't steer or spook or buck, kick, rear, whatever. All of that filthy behaviour is a horse that's just stressed and anxious and, and flipping into flight mode because it doesn't understand what you want. Mm-hmm. And remember, you can find all the books recommended by our guests at horsechats.com slash books. You can have a look at the guest page for the individual book they recommended or just look at the recommended books by order of popularity at horsechats.com slash books. So to do with training the horse, and, and this is sort of bringing you as a horse trainer now, what would you say, you know, what do you think is the big lesson that, that you could give people from From, from a training perspective? Yeah. yeah. Really... Uh, Going into John Chatterton's work there, because uh, he's an absolute genius, I call him Mozart. 
<laughs> because what we're traditionally taught is to, you know, stop horses from exploding or, or use fatigue to get them um, to get them to behave. But you know, you need patience. You need to allow the horse to make the mistake, and then then it has a con- uncomfortable consequence. So that you can stay cool, calm, and collected while the horse is getting anxious. If you've got a known series of responses to the horse's naughty behaviours, then you can stay relaxed, which will then help the horse to be relaxed. I mean, it doesn't matter what training technique you use. All the good horsemen, they all kind of walk around very slowly and chilled out, don't they? They never look like they're reacting to the horses. Yeah. So if you feel like you are reacting to the horse, it's just because you don't have enough answers for the things the horses are presenting to you. Mm-hmm. But coming back to John's work there, and it's a pity he's ageing and, and we're going to, you know, he won't be around for, I don't believe, too much longer because he's 72, so I can't expect him to keep training horses at this age. <laughs> I mean, he is, but but it's, it's a shame I didn't discover him 30 years ago because I would really push him 30 years ago. But, yeah, get those basic steps into the horses of, of, of how to stand still, how to, how to be handled all over and how to, to listen to leg aids and rein aids and yielding and all that because it just I can't express to you how much of an epic difference it makes. I mean, and considering that I have come from classical dressage since the age of five, basically trained by people out of the Spanish riding school, and yet here I am with that much education finding a little cowboy out of Queensland who's actually got the missing link. Yeah. yeah. Because you put his work in first and then, then you can apply your classical work and the horses it just become like like, I don't know, they have mouths like butter and they're so responsive and light and relaxed and willing and they're not stressed and they learn so fast. Mm-hmm. So, yes, spend the time. In fact, we were at the track this morning with our girls. The girl fell off the saddle and the horse the saddle fell on the ground and there we were, we were walking along with two racehorses. Most people think they're mad, but... But they just stopped and stood around it while we got reorganised. One of the other people down there saw us and said, gosh, your horses are so quiet. And then we dawdled off to the float and got this organised again and loaded them up. And, and I actually said to Anna in the float, I said, my God, thank God we've spent the time to train these two to behave themselves because coming to the track every week could be quite traumatic if we were dealing with horses off their face and bouncing out of their skin. You know, so people don't want to spend the time doing the early training or the basic steps because they want to go chase their blue ribbons or they want to just jump on and ride. But it just becomes such an unpleasant event. So I would say for everyone out there, young people or anyone playing with their horses, if you're handling your horses and you're cursing and swearing, getting your foot stepped on, your head whacked and bashed into or a horse that can't stand still or you're spending a lot of muscle to get them to behave, take some time and Go a few steps back and get some basic groundwork in there and some basic training. Mm-hmm. So then you can, the pair of you can enjoy the experience more. It's, yeah. it's worth its weight in gold. Yeah. yeah. And, but people don't want to spend that time. Mm. That's good advice. Now, Melanie, you talked about um, a book that you're writing. How far are you off that? <laughs> 27 pages. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope I don't fall off the perch before it gets out because that'll be a damn shame. But, <laughs> I mean, I, it's, it's this particular book, I don't know what its title is, The Myth and Magic of Horses' Feet because when you get feet right, you have, they, um, they just don't break down. Mm-hmm. They can be – well, my two were shot till they were 10 and 11. The shoes came off as 10 – so my, my, that mare I was telling about had the navicular syndrome at four. So I yes. shod her till she was about 11 and then I discovered this whole foot thing and thought it was a load of BS and went, oh, well, I'll pull the shoes off and uh, could always put them back on. Mm. Well, so she had been kind of secretly lame in both front legs from four to 11, but, you know, only I knew about it if I trotted her on a slight heel around on the circle. She'd do one or two short steps as she hit the bottom of the hill and turned, you know, so it was sort of subtle. Mm. Well, so that had been, what, six, seven years she'd been like that. And she used to, because she was 12-year-old by this point in time, so sums that up, she had lost that exquisite, expressive, elastic movement that she had as a youngster. 
and she used to trot around the paddock quite ladylike. And in fact, most of us are used to teenage horses who trot around the paddock sedately, don't they? You know, you kind mm, of almost mm. think it's your training that's making them not run around like lunatics. <laughs> well, anyway, so her shoes came off, and two weeks later, that lameness that she'd had for nearly eight years was gone. I went, uh oh. But uh, whoops. Mm. Anyway, so her brother had the shoes pulled off too because, and he'd had no real symptom. His only symptom was when he walked downhill to go back to the paddock, he used to stop at the top of the hill and look at me. And I was like, what are, you, what are you doing? And he goes, well, I can't walk down the hill. And I said, oh, come on, you slacker. I don't know what you're doing. Drag him downhill. And he'd go down the hill really slowly. That was his only symptom. Yeah. Well, retrospectively, I now know what that was. His feet mm. hurt when he walked down the hill because it was mm. a little sort of steep bit of hill. Um, oh, I've forgotten what I was talking about now, sorry. <laughs> what were we talking about? About your book. <laughs> Oh, my book. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so the book, yeah, the book's about the, the magic of, of what you can achieve with feet because, I mean, I, I've since got another young horse who unfortunately found it here. I moved up to the richest laminitis country in Australia and uh, went away to a conference and it rained and he ate the paddock grew more grass than I was aware it could grow and I came home after being in Perth for mm. seven days and yep. he found it and then... He had, I don't know, five abscesses in five weeks, and on the sixth week he penetrated both front feet, oh, uh, which, you know, I swore and cursed profusely, but anyway, was um, he was getting his treatment from me. And the day I discovered he'd penetrated, I was actually riding him. So, mm. you know, who would have thought that you can ride a penetrated horse? And I don't ride lame horses, I guarantee you that. But he was pottering around walk and trot uh, as part of his rehab and was completely and utterly sound with the management technique that I can use for laminated courses. Mm. So, yes, that's what the book's about. The book's about how you can do astonishing things to horses' feet and resurrect careers and then even treat diseases that previously would cause them to lose their lives. Mm. Mm. Very exciting. How far are we off it? Oh, it's only 27 pages. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> So, no, I've got an enormous amount of work. I've got 14 years of case studies I need to write up and okay. I don't know, probably 800 laminated cases that I need to get written up so that the veterinarians can stop saying, you know, there's no evidence-based medicine for this work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, once the cases are written up, I mean, I, I couldn't even tell you the number of navicular horses that I've resurrected and, and or the number of chronically lame horses. Who, you know, I can have horses that have been lame for two years come to me as a last resort before we put it down, Mel, can you fix it? And I'll tweak their feet and, and uh, you know, do a little, work a little magic and say so we can go riding tomorrow. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's how much you can change them for the better Yes. with with this work. So it's crucial I get this, get my life sorted out and get, get, get the writing to begin. <laughs> All right. What else are you looking forward to? What am I looking forward to? Mm. Oh, I'd like to ride my horse more. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, lo- I'd like to get this work written up so I could ride my horse. Okay. Because at the minute, I only potter about. And they might get a bit of training for about four minutes once a month. And, I mean, they're progressing remarkably quickly considering how pathetic their training <laughs> is. But what I would look forward to is actually doing what I've always wanted to do, which is ride my horse. I mean, I ride five or six times a week, but mm. not in the manner that I would uh, – uh, approval. <laughs> okay, okay. Can you summarise your philosophy with horses just into a message as you go and also talk about uh, how people can contact you? Summarise my philosophy. Uh, be patient, be kind and be thoughtful and always think if I was in the horse's shoes, what would I be feeling like? Yeah. I think would probably help you. People, people need to put themselves in the horse's position and stop thinking it's just a reactive creature. It's actually they're quite intelligent animals and uh, yeah, we need to empathise with them a lot more, particularly riders and trainers. And then you might understand why they're reacting. That's yes. what I would probably say. Yeah. 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 And how can they contact? Yeah. 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 The phone on my website, theproblemhorse.com. Okay. And those details will be on horsechats.com 
slash Melanie Quick or else uh, horsechats.com, search for Melanie, search for Quick and you'll find that or you can probably search for Laminitis and you'll probably find her as well. That'll be great. And, look, thanks very much for talking to us. I just think we've sort of jumped around a bit. You've got so many different areas of, you know, not just one area of expertise but several areas of expertise that I I feel like I can ask you another hundred questions. But, you know, I'm sure you're quite a busy person as well. But we'd love to have you back again sometime to go over some of this in more depth. That would be brilliant. That's a a pleasure. Hopefully it helps. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.